you to queer bars. I'm gonna drive you in queer cars. You're gonna meet all my queer friends. Our queer queer fun it never ends. We're gonna have a happy life. Both of us are gonna be the wife. Watching last year's parade, I knew that I had to have a bike for this year's parade. <laughs> I'm not going to be standing on the sidelines anymore. So, um, yeah. <laughs> if you don't already have a pink ribbon, please make a donation to the People with AIDS Coalition so we can stand in solidarity at our moment of silence at 2.30. Gay Pride Days celebrate the history of each person's coming out. Until recently, it was too frightening for most lesbians to be visible. And even today, it isn't always that easy. The one thing about coming out for me is you cross a threshold. All of a sudden, you say, I need to belong to something. And you've been in this very weird state in your sexuality, your relationship, in the world, your work life, your social life. It, all these ramifications come to. And something about the bike is that all of a sudden, as a woman, you've been given the keys to a new kingdom. The name of my bike is Elsewhere, and it really describes how I am on the bike, and I think being a lesbian is also maybe about being elsewhere in this world. And being a lesbian, coming out is saying, you know what, I am I may not be happy about this because I kept it for myself for so long, but now that I've come out, I'm admitting a part of me that I was really afraid to admit. I'm who I am, I'm happy to say this is who I am. And there's a, a liberation that is so wonderful about it. And the onus becomes on other people, whether they accept you or not. The exuberance they display commemorates the Stonewall Rebellion of 1969, the anniversary of the gay civil rights movement in America. 5,000 lesbians and gays came to the first gay pride march. Today's attendance is expected to exceed one million. Amsterdam, the lesbian and gay capital of Europe, honors being gay another way. This morning, she gently haunts Sunday sleepers to the wakefulness of her forgotten past. These women are remembering lesbians and gays who died in concentration camps during the war. Most people don't realize that homosexuals were the first to be incarcerated. And it is only of late that evidence about their plight has been disclosed. Their destination, the Homo Monument, the only permanent marker to gay people in the West. The triangles once worn by gay prisoners in the camps now serve as a reminder of the ongoing struggle for freedom. Those who selected the design for the monument said, it is positioned to catch a favorable wind, offer a safe place for human desire, and give the moment a sense of intimacy. The flowers are placed inside an inscription which reads, such a limitless longing for friendship. In a time-worn city like Amsterdam, 
History can be found in the most unexpected places. Café Saren, a gathering place for dykes, has existed for the past 20 years. But bars and cafes have been a rich part of gay subculture for centuries. And in lesbian folklore, some of these bars are legendary. During World War II, a notorious lesbian, Bette Van Buren, ran a famous pub for women. Men were welcome if they permitted Bette to trim their ties at the door. Inside, the walls are covered with cravats. Café Mancia was located in the historic Red Light District of Amsterdam, known as the Zeedijk. Bette was respected by pimps and cops alike, and affectionately known as the Queen of the Zeedijk. She was courageous and kind, giving shelter to those wanted by the Nazis and hiding arms for the resistance. Once a year, she threw a lavish party for the elderly in the neighborhood. The whole community attended. When Bette died, she was waked in the cafe on her favorite billiards table. The Salvation Army played her a last farewell while the others raised glasses in toasts to the memory of... Queen of the Zaydike. Although attendance at Betts fell short soon after her death, the tradition she was part of continues. At the Homolulu, another lesbian-owned establishment accommodates the community, as lesbians enjoy their sexuality without fear in this openly gay city. attitude has to do a lot with fear. I think it is important that in a society there is an openness about uh, sexuality at all because homosexuals will profit from that. I think every country which uh, suppresses uh, uh, sexuality as a whole, there they produce homophobic attitudes. No matter where a gay woman lives, Coming out is an act of courage. Until the 20th century, there was no language to describe this kind of love. The word lesbian was not recognized, and sex between women was thought of as inconceivable. Well, when I first uh, thought I was a lesbian, it was quite late in life because I didn't know the word. Uh, but very early in my life I had a fascination for girls, for teachers, maybe even in kindergarten it started uh, being fascinated by women. Wie das für mich war, das wusste ich schon immer. Das ist so bin ich auf die Welt gekommen. Da könnte ich wetten, also mein Interesse galt schon als die ersten Erinnerungen sind mit acht Jahren so massiv, dass ich mich für Frauen interessiert habe. Das merkte ich einfach daran, dass meine Freundinnen oder äh, Spielgefährtinnen das alles ganz anders sahen. I first realized that I was queer when I was uh, about 12 and I was getting a lot of crushes on girls and I was uh, courting them. I wanted to put my arm around my best friend in the movie theater, that sort of thing. And I also, being a little bit precocious, I was bringing psychology books home. I read the psychology books and 
they told me that it was a phase and that I would outgrow it when I was 15. When I was 15, I saw Shakespeare's play, Midsummer Night's Dream, and for the first time in my life, there was somebody on stage to identify with. That was the character Puck. Uh, when I saw it, which was a completely um, androgynous blend of male and female, just a gorgeous character, the fairy, the good fairy. So I instantly knew uh, that that's who I was. I um, was on the ballroom floor doing a rumba and I looked around and this woman walked into the studio and she was totally androgynous, extremely beautiful, had this enormous voice. I had never thought the word lesbian, never conceptualized the concept, it had never entered my mind. I was a perfect little heterosexual girl. And um, she walked in and she asked for a job and the manager said, can you dance? And she said yes and he said, well, you know, let's see. And she walked out onto the dance floor and instead of dancing with the man I was dancing with, she said, may I cut in and stood in front of me and took me in her arms and danced me around the ballroom floor. <laughs> I was totally impressed. Nothing came easy. There were no... There were no easy access sexual experiences for a young woman like myself coming out. Um, they were stolen moments with straight girlfriends who were pretending that they were just practicing to be with their boyfriend. Or they were being a young baby butch coming up against a street prostitute uh, femme in the bar who was razor sharp in experience and having no idea how to approach her, having no idea what I was trying to negotiate with sex whatsoever. Being a black woman coming out in the 50s meant coming out as a black woman, it meant coming out as a lesbian, it meant coming out as a human being, it meant insisting on myself as being a presence, as being not invisible. Not invisible as a fat, black, lesbian, activist, almost blind woman who didn't speak, but thought a lot, and wrote. It meant coming out as a poet. Even the gay city of Amsterdam has its dark side lost to memory. The town square masks its past in a cloak of gentle merriment. But during the 1700s, it was a place of execution. In this period, many women reconstructed gender by cross-dressing. And if caught, the consequences for these passing women could be devastating. Here in the town hall, they crossed a miniature world on their way to public trials for their crimes of passion. Such an act was called peccatum mutum, the silent sin the sin that cannot be named. The victims pondered their fate as they faced the magistrates seated in front of these female figures, symbolizing shame and suffering. The recommended penalty, strangulation, burning, or drowning. The more fortunate received commuted sentences of life imprisonment or banishment from the city. This is Maria van Antwerpen, a typical cross-dresser of the period. She is described as a practicing soldier, a tailor, a healer of skin diseases, and a pipe-smoking patriarch fond of fishing. She traveled the Dutch countryside courting available women, and at 29 years of age, married Johanna Kramer. It took her bride three years to discover Maria's true sex. She was tried and banished from the city in which they lived. Maria wrote in her autobiography, 
It often made me wrathful that Mother Nature treated me with so little compassion against my inclinations and the passions of my heart. There were many women like Maria, and hundreds of trials of passing women took place across Europe. In a world cognizant only of love between male and female, it is little wonder that some concluded, if I have feelings for women, then I must be a man. I began to pass with the aid of hormones um, when I was about, I don't even remember, maybe I was 18, maybe I was 20. I'm not even sure, looking back, when, I, when it began. I felt like an endangered species on the street. I had no support. I had no job. And suddenly, through passing, I was able to find a job. Nobody bothered me much on the street. The guys at work were nice. Some of the women flirted. It seemed like a tremendous relief. It was the first time in my life that I had enough relief from pressure as a butch to be able to look at the world and see things like class and race, to be able to see how society was structured outside of my own oppression. I no longer had to run with my hands over my head protecting myself through life without looking. And so I think it both enabled me to look at the world in a new way but it also was a building oppression. It was one that built slowly and gradually. I began to understand that what I had to sacrifice was having given up my entire past to rewrite my own history, where I went to high school, who I was, how I looked at the world. Everything had to be rethought out in order to pass because passing is invisibility. The persecution of passing women in Europe forced many to seek out the safety of a new world. In the mid-1800s, a French immigrant cross-dresser, Jeannie Bonnet, sought refuge on California's Barbary Coast. She frequented the brothels as a customer, convincing many to leave the trade. She organized them in all women's gangs, and they survived by petty stealing. She was often arrested by San Francisco police for wearing male attire. Her funeral was described in the press of 1876 as, quote, having been attended by many women of the wrong class, the tears washing little furrows through the paint on their cheeks. On one of Jeannie's visits to the brothels, she fell in love with a prostitute, Blanche Bounot. As she lay in Bounot's bed, an assassin's bullet was fired through the window. Bonnet was dead, murdered by her lover's jealous pimp. is a virtual